Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Matthew, and also good morning, lectures. And so I hope that today we are all here in a good condition. So then we can have a good discussions today. Okay, with our uh, outstanding topic that's about Karen issues in vessel compact. Okay, so I'm going to uh, give the rules okay, for the students. So in a discussion time, when you are curious to have a questions to math or just to confirm whatever you got from math, so please, uh, you can write the questions using a chat features okay, in the Zoom, or you can unmute yourself. Please mention your name and also your class in Tassel. So that would be better when you just um, communicate directly with math, asking the questions or just confirm whatever you got uh, or need re-explain yeah, from Matthew regarding our topic today. Okay, without further ado, I welcome Matthew to present today's topic about current issues in a TESOL context. Matthew, the screen is yours. Great, thank you so much and welcome. I will be sharing my screen and a PowerPoint uh, presentation across the evening. I will also sometimes stop and uh, turn the PowerPoint off just so that you can also see maybe my face better. Uh, with the whole uh, Zoom feature. So tonight's topic, as has been introduced, is current issues in TESOL contexts. And I'm very happy to talk about this topic because right now the field of TESOL is undergoing rapid and dynamic changes. In fact, the past 30 to 40 years of TESOL theory is being disrupted by new understandings, which we'll talk about this evening. So when I give a presentation, I always like to start with an overview so that people can uh, know what to expect from the evening. And I will talk for about you know, 75, 80, 90 minutes, and then we'll have a good time at the end for questions and answers. Um, and as Deanne said, you may please uh, put your uh, questions in the chat, and we will try to address these later on. So I will give a personal introduction. And then I will ask us some questions to help us think about what are the things that we already know about this field. And then I will spend a significant amount of time talking about the multilingual turn that the field is currently facing, looking at the theory of translanguaging, and also the conception of dynamic bilingualism. Then we will spend some time discussing ratio linguistics or the conflation of race and language and how people perceive the speaking subject. We will also talk about, within the US context, academic literacy, but I think this is also a concern uh, for uh, people around the, the world who are concerned with the language that is related to uh, schooling, which um, you know Jim Cummins used to refer to as, um, as the academic language, although this, this term is currently being uh, disputed. And then we'll talk about you know, where is the field headed next? Um, I think this is an exciting season to be a TESOL educator, but it is also one where there's a lot of uh, tension right now and a lot of uh, different people who feel very strongly about where the field has been and where the field should be going. And then we'll end with a wrap up and the time for questions and answers. So I just want to introduce myself. I am Dr. Daru, and this is a picture of my family. We took it this past summer. Uh, at a local uh, uh, organic farm where they had really delicious food and you could feed goldfish and uh, small animals. So it was a lovely uh, day for my family. So across the front is my daughter, Madeline, and she is eight. She's in the blue shirt uh, tank top. And she and I share a birthday, which I think is really fun to have a birthday with your daughter. And then my daughter, Katrina, who is 10, and I'm in the back and my wife, Sally. So. I was born in the United States and in the state of California, and I grew up in Michigan. Uh, both states are close to the water. California is close to the Pacific Ocean, and Michigan is part of the Great Lakes region. And so there are five big lakes in the United States, and my home was very close. I could go to the beach as a boy and walk along the lakeshore. Um, but most of my time and experience was shaped by my 10 years living in China. So when I graduated from university, I took a one-year teaching appointment in, uh, in Guangzhou near Hong Kong and uh, really fell in love with the Chinese people, the Chinese language, and the Chinese culture, and then went on to uh, 
to live there for, for nine years after that. Um, my background, I taught high school English, so English literature, English poetry, um, and some parts of grammar in the US for three years. But I spent over you know, 10 years as a language educator and teacher educator in China. So it was at this time that I came to see myself as being a bilingual person and came to understand what it meant to be a speaker of more than one language and also a knower of more than one language, right? Because uh, fluency in language extends beyond just uh, our ability to speak it, but can we read it? Can we write it? Can we um, you know, dream in a foreign language or an additional language? Or can we even um, you know, grapple with ideas that are complex in a different language? Um, and my master's degree is in intercultural relations. So later on, I'll be giving uh, a talk around um, intercultural competence or communicative competence with attendance to culture. Um, and so a lot of my learning was, was done as, as part of my uh, graduate studies at the master's level. Um, and then, as I said, I am, I'm a speaker of Chinese and I'm also receptive in French. Uh, my French learning took place uh, for four years in high school in the American uh, high school setting. And the, 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 the language of French was mostly taught to me using the audio lingual method um, and also the grammar translation method. So these are you know, older forms of understanding for second language acquisition that today have kind of fallen out of favor. Um, when I was studying French at the time, I did not know that it was called audiolingual or that it was called the grammar translation. I just knew that even though I studied French for so long, I was not very good at using French. Um, I could conjugate verbs, but if I went to Paris and wanted to have a lovely conversation in the cafe with another French speaker, my communicative competence was actually quite small, which is not good after studying a language for four different years. So, you know, I always begin uh, my, my conversations with building on what is already present, right? When we think about what is already present, it's all of the learning that we bring with us into a classroom space. So, you know, some people would say, oh, the teacher is like a, a, a teapot and the student is like the teacup and the teacher will pour all the knowledge into the empty teacup. But in fact, our students are not empty teacups in my imagination. Our students come, you know, with, with uh, maybe they love video games or maybe they love reading or they love sports. Um, they have different uh, cultural practices. So maybe they follow a religious tradition. Um, maybe they grew up reading a holy text in their, in their uh, childhood, right? So all of these things are the things that we bring with us into our learning. So we would often call this stance taking an assets oriented stance. Um, for, for many long years, the field was very concerned with a deficit orientation, what students don't know, what students lack, what students can't do. And while it's true that students sometimes don't know some things or sometimes aren't always going to make the full mark or even sometimes like have confusion, uh, it doesn't mean that we start from a place where there's nothing there. We actually start from the place where, where there's a lot there. So my, my conversations for us tonight is, you know, have you heard of the theory of translanguaging? Could you define dynamic bilingualism? Could you talk about the ways that Jim Cummins' uh, groundbreaking work is now falling out of favor in our field? Um, could you explain why Krashen and Monitor Model is no longer the gold standard in TESOL education? Could you grapple with register and pragmatics and understand um, how Jonathan, uh, uh, Jonathan Rosa and Nelson Flores are speaking back to race in language, right? So these are all uh, current debates within the field and also just looking at um, for so many years the goals of, of TESOL was to be like a native speaker, right? So I went to China in large part because the Chinese government valued the American accent and the Chinese government valued uh, teachers from America informing their students. And so even as a young teacher, I was labeled a foreign expert um, and I was 22. And the only thing that made me an expert was that I grew up in a country that happened to speak English, right? So I was no expert of grammar. I was no expert of pragmatics. In fact, my first year as a TESOL teacher, I couldn't even tell you what pragmatics were. I didn't really understand these terms, right? Um, but because I was a native speaker, therefore I had like all of the, the capital, uh, the cultural capital as we think from uh, the work of Bonnie Norton or Bordeaux uh, that gave me this job, right? Um, 
so as as we enter tonight's conversation, like I will definitely share from my own experiences and and be a little bit critical of of my own experiences because um, there's a lot of things that I know now that I've studied and learned that I didn't know then. And so I made some wrong assumptions about language and languaging and how we learn things. And I think one of the great things about being an educator is that we can be lifelong learners and we can continue to shift our thinking and shift our ideas. We can be confronted with new knowledge that challenges old knowledge. So all of these things collectively help us to move our fields forward. And I think one of the broadest questions today is, how is globalization shaping languaging in the 21st century? So I've already given topics around you know, current debates in, in literacy. We've talked about digital literacy with some of the other students. We've talked about the shift uh, from print-based to, to digital literacies. And so collectively, all of these things are a response to globalization. And yet we have seen on the global uh, stage that because of COVID-19 and the pandemic, there has been limitation to, to movement, uh, borders are closing, um, and yet despite this, there's still a lot of connections. So here I am in America on a Tuesday night speaking to my colleagues in Indonesia on a Wednesday morning, right? Uh, Zoom is a, is a product of globalization. In order to, to keep things going, we need to have resources that can let markets remain open and let ideas flow and change. Um, but one of the one of the downsides of this is uh, a theory called neoliberalism, which has some positive things, but also uh, has has in many ways made language a commodity, right? So in a competitive market, you know, the the student who knows three languages could get a better job than the student who just knows one language, right? Uh, but sometimes that's not the case. Sometimes you can know three languages and they overlook you for a job because they want someone who's a native speaker or they want someone who's white and not someone who's black, right? So these are, these are real things that happen in our broader context. And we'll talk about those more tonight. But the main outcome is that we can apply theory to praxis. So we have the theoretical and then we have the teaching and we should take the theory to inform the practice, right? They should go hand in hand. So as we come out of the evening, we'll think about how can you design lesson plans or design curricula or curriculum with a heteroglossic focus, right? And we think about uh, the field has long been monoglossic, right? Like English only, or even we think about the title, teaching English to speakers of other languages, right? There's the focus on English um, and then other, right? And so, you know, the consideration is the person who's not speaking English is other when in fact more people in the world speak languages other than English combined than English, right? I mean, um, if you take apart like home languages or L1 compared to L2, right? So um, we wanna definitely have this expanded notion of languaging. And when I use the word languaging, it's, it's active, right? It's a verb form. So it's a, a present continuous idea. So these are the ideas that we will seek to build upon tonight. And we will begin our discussion around the multilingual turn. And the multilingual turn in TESOL is being led in large part by Ophia Garcia, by Li Wei, and then as well by these two other scholars who are Nelson Flores on the top and Jonathan Rosa on the bottom with the facial hair, the beard. So um, we are grappling with this idea of what happens when we consider languages as multiple and many, and how do we build on students who enter into our classrooms with a lot of linguistic knowledge uh, that necessarily isn't or hasn't always been uh, taken up in the field of TESOL. And this push is coming as a result of two recent theoretical shifts or, or ideologies, beliefs about language and language learning, these ideas. The one, as I said, is translanguaging, and the other, as I noted prior, is ratiolinguistics. And so tonight we'll spend some time uh, sorry, this morning, because it's my night, this morning we'll take some time uh, identifying what these uh, shifts are doing to the field of TESOL. So I begin with this image, and this image is probably very similar to you. So I'm in Miami, Florida, and Miami is currently, uh, you know, uh, seasonal is, is we have a wet season and a dry season, but very similar to many places in Indonesia, the, the weather is uh, not four seasons, right? We have a very tropical and temperate climate throughout most of the year. So perhaps you've encountered a tree like this before. Um, and so I just, I welcome you in the chat if you want to use the chat feature. Um, 
to say you know, some things about this tree. As you look at this image, what are some things that you're noticing about this tree or this tree system? Thank you. A student has said it's a very big tree. It's true, it's super large. It's, it's bigger than most trees. What else are we noticing about this tree? It's branching, right? So we can see as the tree has the branches, you can see that it drops other supports, right? And so the supports that come off the branches. Someone is identifying this as a specific type of tree. This is a banyan tree, right? Now I am showing you only half of the tree. Where is the rest of the tree? What parts of the tree are we not seeing? Right, we're not seeing under the ground, right? So if we think about this tree, yes, the roots and the root system is almost identical. If we could take away the ground and show under the ground, we would see that the root system is just as deeply uh, like this and integrated as the top part. So this tree has all the top parts that are dropping down parts and other parts underneath. So when we think about the root system, this tree is an integrative whole. We have the top part and we have the bottom part and it's a network of systems of roots and branches that give the tree its flourishing, right? We can see that this tree is a healthy tree, that it's a living tree, that it's a dynamic tree and in fact, as a tree continues to grow, it will continue to drop down the little tendrils that will become parts of the trunk, and then that will go into the ground system, right? It's designed to do this. This tree was made to be in this way. Just like all of us are language users, and we were all designed with a natural and innate capacity to language, right? We know from the principles of first language acquisition that a baby in Bangkok, a baby in Boston, and a baby in Beirut, if they have normal cognitive abilities, will learn language in certain ways at certain times. Even though the vocabulary and the phonemes and the grammar are different, we all acquire language pretty much sequentially at de different developmental stages from the time that we're babies. We're hardwired to be languagers. However, our use of additional languages, second languages, third languages, fourth languages is often acquired, right? No one, no one just um, like happens to naturally learn French, right? If it's not your first language, you must take some time to study the language or to be immersed in the language or to apply things from your first language to your second language. Now, this differs in homes where there's bilingual parents and the parents are speaking two languages, maybe simultaneously at the same time. But for most people in the world, when they acquire a second language, uh, in, in, in our context, it's in university or in high school, they're not necessarily growing up bilingual, but they're choosing to become bilingual. Um, sometimes that happens from a very young age and sometimes that happens into adolescence or into adulthood. So when we think about uh, this, this tree, I think this tree is a good metaphor for the idea of repertoire, which is what uh, Garcia and colleagues are discussing, is this idea of these integrated holes. Um, and so we'll, we'll further understand some of these ideas, but I thought it would be very helpful to show you this. Uh, I often do this in my teaching, right? This visual metaphor, right? Um, I showed you an image and I had you describe the image and I suggest how the image is a representation. It's, it's, a, it's a, a symbol uh, if you will, for a concept that we're talking about here tonight, which is this concept of translanguaging or this concept of repertoire or this con concept of language as an integrated whole, right? Not separated, but integrated. Okay, so recently, Zhong Feng Tian and colleagues uh, put out an edited volume called Envisioning TESOL Through a Translanguaging Lens. And this book looked at the way that the field of translanguaging is shifting in its understandings. I actually had the privilege of publishing a chapter in this edited volume, along with other scholars in the field of TESOL who are seeking to shift these understandings. So when we think about translanguaging, if we want to break out the etymology of the word, trans 
is this idea of these flows or moving beyond, right? And languaging is a focus on what language does. It's an active thing, not just a passive thing, what language is. So translanguaging seeks to show language beyond these uh, bundled categories of named languages. And so when I say named languages, it's often connected to the nation state, right? So we know in the modern era that languages are connected to countries. And to be French is to be a francophone, right? To be Canadian means you might be bilingual in French and in English. However, most of these languages are a result of colonization. So there's a reason why you can go to certain African nations and they're speaking French, or you can go to Brazil and they're speaking Portuguese, right? How could such a small country like Portugal influence the wide linguistic practices of a whole large country in South America? These things are related to empire and empire building that happened historically uh, as Europe expanded its influence around the globe. And so when we think about these notions of how languages are connected to nation states, there's a sense of preservation. But as the world markets grew, you know, there, there's a switching between languages. Now, this is nothing new. In the ancient world, people would travel the Roman roads and they would take their languages and their cultures and their markets uh, and expand that to other places, right? So historically throughout the world, anytime there's been an exchange of goods and services, there's also been an exchange of language. So we can't divorce language from the economy or language from trade or language from uh, you know, sharing resources. But largely speaking, because each country wants to form a national identity, the best way to form a national identity is through a connection to that language or to those linguistic practices. But in the modern world, there's a sense to move beyond just, I'm a French speaker or I'm a English speaker. It's true. I might know French and English, or I might know Chinese or Indonesian, right? But there's variation, there's dialect, all of these things are part of my linguistic repertoire, right? So if I wanna speak a vernacular or a dialect of English, that's part of languaging, right? There are world Englishes and then there are Creoles and variations within language. So all of these things are working in like in a concert of the way that we communicate and make meaning. Even tonight, I've been talking a lot with my hands, right? So we know that gesture is a form of semiotic. And I said to you like earlier, four things. So when I hold up the four fingers, it gives you the idea of the, the four points that I'm making to reinforce what I'm saying to you, right? Earlier, I talked about theory and I talked about practice going together for pedagogy, right? So taking theory and taking practice and putting them together. I am reinforcing what I'm languaging through the use of gesture, also through the tone of my voice and through, and through my speech. So when we consider uh, former ways of languaging, we had a, a more traditional view of languaging that said that language is two autonomous linguistic systems. Excuse me, I'm gonna sneeze for just a second. Okay, it passed, I'm sorry. So traditional bilingualism looks at language one and language two, almost like there's the Chinese side of my brain and there's the English side of my brain. And that underneath, oh, here comes this, it might come, I'm sorry. If I sneeze, I apologize. Um, but the, the function of the language is was seen as being separate, right? So generally thinking it was like the solitudes, language one, language two, language three, and it's like, in my brain, I have to switch from the English part of my brain to the Chinese part of my brain, right? But this theory was then modified by Jim Cummins. And he talked about inter, inter, interdependence of the ling, linguistic features, right? So L1 goes to L2 and the function of the language, there's, there's the code switching or there's the thinking in one and doing in the other. And all of this was a part of the underlying common proficiency. But when Ophia Garcia and Lee Wei theorized translanguaging, they viewed dynamic bi bilingualism. And they said, when we think about translanguaging, all parts of a repertoire have the functions of language. So I think about my uh, students in the US who maybe they grew up in Spanish speaking homes. So they're learning English in school, but many of the terms and expressions in Spanish have cognates in English or vice versa. Now, when I was studying Chinese, 
there was not cognates. And so it was very difficult because it was like a, an additional foreign language, right? I couldn't draw on something I knew of a linguistic feature in English and apply that linguistic feature to Chinese. But for students who speak French or Italian or German or the Romance languages, there's, there's cognates. And so they're able to, to draw within and across these cognates, right? So generally speaking, dynamic bilingualism sees language as a unified whole. Uh, thank you uh, so much for that recommendation, right? So um, I'm going to share two images. And again, this is this idea of visual metaphor. And, and the picture itself is not very good. But what we kind of see here is a color wheel. We see yellow and orange and violet and red and blue violet, right? All of these kind of uh, colors, right? And so traditional bilingualism is concerned about name languages as connected to the nation state. So I said this before, France and French is a part of national identity, right? And so in this view, uh, the languages are siloed or the languages are uh, kind of in solitude. But if we think about a visual metaphor for translanguaging, translanguaging is a view of this dynamic bilingualism. So this uh, kaleidoscope image shows how all of the different colors are you know, together and they have different features and they're grouped together and they're grouped apart. But holistically speaking, this image represents dynamic bilingualism. So again, one more time, we see, oops, uh, I, I went the wrong way. We see uh, traditional bilingualism as more separate, right? And dynamic bilingualism as, as much more integrated. So collectively, these are ways, just like the tree is a visual metaphor, these colors is another form or expression for making something that's abstract more concrete. Okay, so I'm gonna give you just a second to read about Jade. And Jade is a student that talks about understandings of former views of languaging with current views of languaging. So mono, monolingualism or bilingualism with translanguaging. So in this assignment, Jade, who is a master's student at a university in the United States, is trying to show how she understands the difference between monolingualism and translanguaging. And you can see in the image that she selected, the, the, the speaker uh, is speaking these independent languages, right? And in the brain, there's kind of these circles that show maybe this is Spanish and French and German and Italian, right? as opposed to the image on the, on the, on the right-hand side where translanguaging is this idea that there's um, all of this whole integration of the language and the linguistic practices. So the hard thing about this theory, like any theory, is that it's not like we can cut open our heads and, and find a repertoire. It's not as if we can go in and see like, is there truly something in our brains as part of the cognition that, that makes language operate in this way. We know parts of the brain that process languaging, but we don't really know, you know, is, there, is it segmented or is it together? But generally speaking, the field of, of uh, TESOL is grappling with what might it mean to understand language as not isolated, but language as integrated. And that is the current debate in the field. Some people would say, no, language is isolated, but other people are saying, no, in fact, languaging might be more integrated. They're not necessarily independent, they're integrated. So this is another visual metaphor that would reinforce. So in the United States, they took a very famous Japanese uh, television show uh, and they made it into what they call the Power Rangers. And when we think about the Power Rangers, each of the Power Rangers had their own color and each of the Power Rangers had their own machine. But when they got together to fight a big monster, they formed their individual machines into this Megazord, right? And so this is a representation of the individual Power Rangers. 
so if we want to think about old old versions of of languaging they see languages separate right so these different colors could represent different named languages whereas translanguaging sees all of the languages as part of again this unified whole so i've shared with you a tree image i've shared a kaleidoscope image i've shared a, um, a television reference all of these are different visual representations of the theory of a static bilingualism which is more fixed and fluid dynamic bilingualism or translanguaging which represents these holes or these 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 uh, repertoires that we have and so i'm going to give you just a, a small uh, moment to to glance at this chart and then uh, when you're done glancing at the chart, I will I will share some thoughts and ideas uh, behind this chart with you. So on the left hand side of this chart, we have some of the ideas or beliefs that underscore the version of vision of translanguaging. For example, translanguaging focuses on language that goes beyond words. And so this would include the use of signs and symbols and gestures, uh, tone of voice, rate of speech. All of these things impact the communicative uh, event between two speakers of languages, whether they share languages or have different languages. As well, translanguaging adopts a multilingual literacy approach, uh, which suggests that learners are often communicating with one another. They're negotiating for meaning. They're trying to understand what is being said or how does what they know impact what they're saying or thinking or writing or reading. And collectively, as they negotiate for meaning, both of the interlocutors are able to draw upon all of their linguistic repertoire in supporting their literacy whether that's spoken or written or visual or oral, um, all of those things are, are part of the affordances of a multilingual approach. When we think about mediation, language is often being mediated by a number of different factors. So culture can mediate language, um, sound can mediate language, tone, uh, voice, all of these things uh, would be used of support for language learning. So just like Zoom is mediating our meeting tonight and Zoom gives me audio and Zoom gives me video and Zoom gives me text, right? The Zoom itself is multimodal. We have visual, we, you can hear me. If I mute myself, then you can see me, but you can't hear me. Uh, the chat feature allows us to, to type our questions even though they're not spoken out loud, right? So all of these things are helping to mediate our understanding. And the same thing is true in translanguaging theory all of the repertoire, all of the resource collectively help to understand these ideas. There's also the meta functions of bilingual language, which allows for the co-construction of language or of knowledge. So as students draw upon their cognates, as students draw upon their lives and their lived experiences, as students understand register or pragmatics or tone, they're able to negotiate how they should perform in a different uh, cultural or linguistic context, right? So I often give the example of speech giving. I lived in China and I've shared this uh, both mornings so far in these training sessions. In China, the banqueting culture is a big part of how business is done and how relationships are honored. And in a Chinese context, when you enter into a banquet room, it's often around a circle table, but the person who is the most important will sit opposite of the door. And the person who is least important will have their back to the door, right? And when, when you're eating Chinese dishes, you should not start eating any food until the most important person eats the food or welcomes everyone to eat the food. When the most important person stands up to give a speech, then the second most important person will stand up to give a speech. And then the less important person should respond to the most important person and the second most important person, right? So all of this, is part of part of a linguistic 
and cultural event where you must understand the flows of how the culture and the language and the toasting and the speaking all inform the event that's happening, right? Which is this banquet. So a, a trans uh, languaging subject will take all of these things to flow for how they should engage in this, in this event, right? And then as well, we're always mashing things up, right? So language is constantly being transformed by culture and by context, right? So if you think about in the last, you know, couple of years, Apple is really big on this, right? They have uh, the iPhone and they have the iPad and they have the, the iMac, right? Um, and in the US context, um, we're, we're making up new words all the time. So about 10 years ago, people started talking about something called a, uh, a bromance, right? And the, the bromance was this idea of a friendship between two men, right? And it wasn't, it, it, it matches up brotherhood and romance, right? And so it was an appropriate way to show a deeper friendship in the US context between two men that was not like a, a, a loving relationship, right? It was just this mutual respect for one another, right? So brotherhood and romance match up together is bromance, right? So we're constantly seeing how these ideas are shifting, right? Some terms uh, change in meaning. So in the US context, um, some words that used to be regular words became derogatory or became uh, negative words, right? And words that used to be bad words are, are no longer considered bad, right? So as we think about translanguaging, we're looking at the flows and the shifts of how these language change over time, are remixed, are recontextualized, are re-understood, right? And it provides resources to students in schools, right? So if students don't know the word, but they can point or they can gesture or they can nod an affirmation, that's a different way of showing understanding using language across processes. Now, this has already happened for many years. Some of this is not new, but it's just a new way that this has been understood holistically uh, as a package of resources that people can use as they communicate meaning across different named languages. Okay, and so I also want to spend some time then now thinking about the notion of language ideologies, right? And language ideologies are these beliefs about language. And so we know that all language has equal communicative uh, potential, right? It's not like I can speak some special language like in Harry Potter and cast a spell, right? I can say the words in Harry Potter but it doesn't make someone shrink or disappear or grow into the size of a rat, right? That just doesn't happen. So all of the languages that we have have equal potential, but yet sometimes people think that one language is better than another language. And when we think about the, the notions of superiority across these forms of language, it's often connected to those people who have power. So the wealthy people or the, 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 the leaders of the nation or the captains of industry. So even when we think about in the US, the US was founded as a form of colonies from Europe. And in large part, uh, the United States was, was trying to seek freedom from Great Britain. And Great Britain had a monarchy and the United States wanted to have a democracy. And so part of the US's founding was breaking away from our mother, right? From, from the queen, right? But if you think about English, you'll hear the phrase or expression, I don't speak the queen's English, right? And the queen's English is referring to the linguistic practices and the variation of the speech patterns of people in Great Britain, right? The queen does not own this language, but when we say it's the queen's English, we're referring to a certain type of language, right? And if you go to the UK and especially to Great Britain and to London, uh, you'll see that within England, there's a lot of hierarchy, right? So who speaks what dialect uh, can impact your social standing and in impact your social class. So in many ways, language ideologies are just beliefs about language for what we desire based on what someone else says is important. And in the field of TESOL, we have most often seen this as connected to the idea of the native speaker. 
And the idealized speaker of English is someone who was born as an English speaker. When that is the standard, it takes away, you know, I want to reduce my accent or I want to sound more like an American, right? And even within the United States, the United States used to have a lot of linguistic variation. We're a big country and there are many states and there are many people from many different backgrounds. In fact, the United States for many years was a bi and multilingual nation. It was only once English became the dominant language that people in the United States became monolingual. Most people in the US that are born in the US and don't have immigrant backgrounds only speak English. So the biggest shift in the United States to standardize our language and to give us this like standard language was with the advent of radio and television. And what was decided was that people from the American Midwest, specifically many people from the state of Ohio, had the most desired accent and their speech should be the speech that everyone else emulated. And so most of the newscasters, even if they were from other backgrounds, would, would train their speech patterns to be like people from the Midwest. And so a Midwest white speaker of English became the standard language bearer in the US context, right? Now, you might think that your English is worse than my English, but I would suggest, even though I'm a native speaker, we are all language learners. We're learning new things and new terms and new ways to use the language. In fact, this year I am now 43 years old, but I am teaching many undergraduates in the US university system. And these students are 20 years old. So they are now 20, 21. They were born the year that I myself graduated from university. And my students will use slang and terms and expressions. And they'll say things I'm like, what are you talking about? I've never heard this word before. I've never heard this term before. And they're like, oh, professor, all the, all the kids on TikTok are doing this. And I say, but I don't have TikTok, right? I know what TikTok is. Um, and so the other day in class, I said to my students, I said, can you give me 10 words that were not used 10 years ago? And instantly they came up with all this term and slang, mostly from their social media feeds. In fact, I have many friends back in China who suggest that there's such generational differences that older Chinese people sometimes don't know what younger Chinese people are saying because the language has shifted so much through these online communicative efforts, right? So what I have is this picture here of a call center. And when we think about uh, in the US context, uh, a call center, um, it's this idea or this notion that um, that I'm 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 asking for help on the phone and I'm talking to someone in India, right? So this is globalization. So oftentimes in the U.S., after you end the call, like for service, like let's say my phone needs a, a fixing, then they'll say, "Please stay on the call for one survey question," and then after the call ends, someone comes on. Thank you for taking this survey. We appreciate your use of this call center. We want to know, could you hear and understand what the call representative was saying? The only question they're asking is whether or not you could understand the call center person because most Americans don't like accented speech. They feel like they can't understand it. In fact, sometimes if someone speaks with an accent and they're speaking English, they will subtitle what that person is saying because they assume that to the native speaker, the listener, the speech is incomprehensible, even though the speech is highly comprehensible, right? So these would be examples of language ideologies. And the field of TESOL is really grappling a lot with language ideologies right now. Whose language practices are the desired language practices? Whose language practices are not desired? Who can be competitive in a global marketplace? What type of English do we want to have? When I lived in China, my students would often say that they spent hours watching the United States television show, Friends. And I said, why are you spending all this time watching Friends? And they said, we want our English to sound like Joey and like Rachel and like Ross and like all of the Friends. So in their idea, in their imaginary, spending time watching this US TV program 
would allow them to sound more like Americans, which they saw as being most desirable. So one of the people that I really appreciate is currently a doctoral student, and he is looking at how language ideologies impact identity. And so this is Vijay Ramajantan, and he um, is often tweeting about language ideologies. And so if you're interested in this topic, I share a link to his Twitter feed because he's often speaking back to the way that the field of TESOL has been too concerned with accent or the way that companies have been too concerned with accent. And what he's trying to advocate for is that people's speech and expression, their parts of their identity, would not be marginalized according to some sort of uh, native speakerism or native speaker form. So if you were to pick up a copy of TESOL Quarterly, you might see that right now articles are being published that push back against the notion of native speakerism or push back on the notion of accent reduction or push back on the notion of world Englishes, right? That, that there's one standard rather than many different forms. So I do encourage you to use this resource. And I think Vijay is doing, or, or Vijay is doing really great work uh, to kind of confront and critique these ideologies around language. And I know I myself am very active on Twitter. I love Twitter as an academic space um, and connecting with other linguists and other people from around the world. And so I think these perspectives are, are very helpful to share uh, the ideas and beliefs behind identity and identity practices. So now we're going to turn our attention to a second main theoretical shift in the field. And this shift has come in the last probably six or so years. So basically from about 2015 onward, both Jonathan Rosa and Nelson Flores, building on the work of H. Sammy Aleem, a professor at UCLA in California, started to theorize how are race and language connected? And so what they asked was, what does it mean to speak as a racialized subject in the contemporary United States? And again, because these, these, uh, all three of these men are um, based out of the US, they're concerned with the United States. But we know that racio-linguistic ideologies are a global phenomenon, right? In large part because anti-Blackness is also a global phenomenon or senses of uh, what many people would call colorism, right? Uh, or this idea that the, the whiter the skin, the better the, better the person, right? Um, all of these ideas are rooted in uh, racist history. And so their focus is not on the speaker, their focus is on the listener. So when you hear someone, how do you perceive of their speech? And I will go back to the, to the former slide here. When you call a call center in India, you don't even have to see the person, just hear their voice, and you can picture what they look like, right? Because so many of us are socialized. If you played an audio clip of a Black woman speaking to most people in the United States and they could not see her face, they would say, that is a Black woman because the dialect, the accent, the mannerisms, the intonation of the speech would, re re would reflect that, right? Um, in other cases, people can read uh, things onto people, right? So uh, in the US, there's something called vocal fry, which is uh, the, 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 the speech intonation patterns. And so like people from California will have a vocal fry and they'll say like, and I'm, I'm gonna do this, but it, it's not a good, uh, interpretation, but it's like, oh my gosh, I can't believe that. Whoa, what just happened? Did you see that? Oh, wow, that's crazy, right? So their speech patterns take on this vocal fry, and it's like kind of this, this, this speech pattern of a particular user to a particular end. So all of these things are how variation is taken up by the person who's listening to it, right? Some people think the speech that I just did, I can't believe it. Whoa, no way, ah, ah, right? This would be like annoying to the speaker. They would say, to the, sorry, to the listener. They would say, don't talk in that way. Or like, your voice is so annoying, right? 
Um, why, why, is, why are you inflecting like that, right? So all of these things are part of broader language ideologies that are connected to how we perceive the, pe the person who is speaking. So the big problem in US schools is that students are often positioned negatively based on their race. So maybe a student has come from Mexico and this student has a brown color to his skin. The student knows many things about science in Spanish, but the student cannot say the same words in English. So when the teacher hears the student speaking, they might think, oh, the student doesn't know very much. In fact, the student knows a lot in their home language in L1. They're just not able to use this knowledge in L2. And so often they are perceived by the teacher as not being intelligent or not being well, well learned or well read or well studied. And often this comes back to interactions among race. So again, when we think about racial linguistics, race is our prefix mashed up with linguistics. So racial linguistics are how linguistics are understood through the lens of race, right? And this is an issue in the US, but I would argue that this is also an issue in the entire, uh, in the entire world. So what I have here is a, uh, a cartoon. Uh, it's an interaction. And so I just want you to read this cartoon or view this cartoon and then maybe put in the chat, how does this cartoon show racial linguistics? Yes, so Mr. Abu Kar is the black man here. What are some things that you're noticing about this image? How might this image be reflective of the racial linguistic ideology? So one student says, uh, maybe the black man, uh, Mr. Abu Bakr, uh, he has accented speech because he's speaking four different languages. What else are we noticing about this uh, image? Yes, the candidate, Mr. Uh, Abu Bakr, is, is rejected for his race, even when he is very suitable for the position, right? He speaks four languages, it's international sales, and yet they say his communication skills are not sufficient for this line of work. What do you notice about the clothing or the attire? Yes, both men are wearing suits. So when we think about uh, the role of business, we can often think about how the attire uh, shows the role. So the interviewee is wearing a very nice suit. He is doing all of the things that would be part of a community. He is a businessman. He is dressed like a businessman. He looks like a businessman. They're both wearing suits, but when the interviewer looks at him, he doesn't read him as a businessman, right? In fact, he's focused more on the color of his skin than on the clothes and on the skills that he has. If um, Mr. Abu Bakr had been 
in the same suit and speaking four languages, but been white or maybe closer to white, like Asian, would he have gotten the position, right? So what this cartoon is showing us is that even if you have multilingualism, and even if you are dressing the part or taking up the identity that is expected, you can still receive discrimination because of these racial connections. So this cartoon is a reflection of a racial linguistic ideology where a man who is very qualified for a job is not receiving the position in large part, not because of how he dresses, not because of how he looks, but because of how he sounds and how he sounds as a black person. Okay, so again, um, when we think about traditional TESOL theories, many of these theories are falling out of favor. So the first one that is uh, falling out of favor is this notion of language separation or the fact that there's kind of the, what some people would call the two solitudes, right? Um, even within Cummins' work, the notion of basic interpersonal communication skills and academic language, right? Bix and Kalp have fallen out of favor. Um, Crashin and the monitor model has also fallen out of favor because uh, it's very difficult to know what is the plus one. And if you have 30 students in a class, the plus one could mean different things uh, for different students. There's also been a falling out of favor around uh, limitations of input and output, and also a cognitive focus uh, where we think about like brain chemistry or we think about uh, the brain and less so about the socio-political factors that are shaping language teaching and learning. So we know that language is a social process. Sometimes language is a political process, but if we focus only on a cognitive perspective that is ignoring the socio-political, then that can be uh, problematic, for, um, problematic for people, right? Um, and then finally, is this notion of TESOL is needing to reckon with both race and colonization, right? So the field of TESOL was often founded um, on you know, white English speakers going to other countries originally uh, to teach English. And um, some of those white English teachers you know, loved the culture and loved the people and did really great things. And within different cultures, TESOL educators were raised up that were national. They were, they were speakers of additional languages themselves that then became TESOL professionals. But um, the field right now is really uh, grappling and wrestling with these tensions around the notions of, of race and its, its uh, historical connections to, to colonization. So um, we find that this has been um, much, much contended and much, much grappled with uh, within, within the broader TESOL community. Um, and so, uh, you know, maybe maybe some of these ideas are new for you tonight, and maybe some of these ideas are um, are, are things you've already read or considered. So, the the front part, the 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 majority of the presentation was around uh, translanguaging and racial linguistic ideologies. But because of Jim Cummins and the work that he did, which was so foundational to these understandings of basic interpersonal communication skills and the, the, um, co the cognitive academic language, uh, you know, Kalp and Fix, um, this, is, this is the point of contention that the field is continuing to grapple with. And so right now, what we will do is we will turn our attention to academic literacy or academic language, right? So many of us are preparing students not just to uh, be speakers of languages other than English, but to use this language for academic learning and for academic purposes, right? And so as we not only learn a language, how can we use the language to communicate concepts and ideas about science or about mathematics or about art or about literature or poetry? So in schooling context, there's often a concern around this academic literacy. So what I have here is uh, a passage from a history textbook in the United States. And what I would like you to do is to read this passage and tell me what do you think this passage is talking about? What's going on here? This is all in English. Can you make meaning of what this passage is trying to say?
feel free to put some ideas into the chat. How many of you would say that this is a difficult passage to understand? It's quite complex, right? So we have some vocabulary that might help us out. So one is uh, the Volstead Act. Okay, uh, someone put in the chat, lawbreakers will take any risk so they can get a jail free card. That's one good idea. Right, so we know that this is around an act, right? And so maybe act makes us think about policy or makes us think about the law or make, because we, we see later we have law breakers, right? But what is a law breaker, right? A law breaker here is a noun, right? A law breaker here is a person. But generally when we think about law breaking, it's a verb, right? So in this passage, we have nouns are, yeah, we have nouns are basically verbs that are working as a noun, right? So for a student who's reading a passage and they think of law breaking as a verb, they have to change in their minds to law breaker as a person, right? It's a thing. It's one who breaks the law. So there's complexity. We would call this in English a nominalization. An anomalization is where the verb, what we would expect to be a verb, uh, sorry, verb is actually acting as a noun, right? Uh, and then we know that these people are trying to break the law and they're trying to get around it, right? So if I was a student in school and I was trying to understand this passage, there's so many complex things that are happening, right? Now, I know that many of you probably have uh, not as familiar with the US uh, constitution or the US history, but there was a time in the United States, you're probably aware of this term, the prohibition. So the prohibition took place in the early 20th century and it banned the sale of alcohol. So this is a passage about the US prohibition. The Volstead Act was a means to prevent the sale and distribution of alcohol, but people wanted to make and sell alcohol. They were willing to keep the alcohol production going and so they were, they had human ingenuity, right? In other words, they were very, very uh, smart, very savvy, very uh, sneaky, very sly for how they got around these rules. And so basically, even though alcohol production and alcohol distribution was forbidden by law, it was something you could be arrested for, they tried to subvert it. They tried to get around it and they tried to get around the enforcers of it, right? So who is enforcing this law? It's people like the police, right? Or it's, it, uh, it's, it's, it's people like the government uh, officers. It could be uh, in the US we have FBI, which is like the Federal Bureau of Investigation, right? And so of, above it all though, right? All above, above all, which means like, most importantly, was its, its failure that resulted from the naive belief of the effectiveness of the law, right? So 
people thought if we pass a law, people will follow the law. But in fact, people in general, if they feel strongly about something, they don't want to follow the law. So we see this a lot in America, sadly. Right now we have the global pandemic, we have COVID, and many places require the mask. But Americans say, I don't want to wear the mask. And so even though there are mask laws in some places, the people say, I will go without the mask, right? So there's this idea that Americans in this passage uh, don't really want to follow the laws. That's one main idea. And the other law is just because you pass a law does not mean it will be followed. So this is the essence of this passage, right? It's these two things, right? Americans don't want to follow the laws. And just because a law is passed does not mean that it will be followed, right? That is so much easier to say to you. And you could understand that than reading this passage. So if we're teaching students how to understand these passages, we have to understand what are the linguistic demands of learning this, and it's often connected to academic literacy. So Nelson Flores, who is one of the people that I spoke about earlier, and you saw his photo, is instead uh, offering up the recommendation or the suggestion, the metaphor for language architecture, right? And when we think about architecture, we think about like scaffolding, right, and supports. So the idea of language architecture is this idea that um, when we're working with students in schools and we want to help them with certain types of language that are specific to an academic discipline, that um, students have this knowledge, but they're not seen as having this knowledge. They're seen as deficient or in need of remediation. So he is suggesting that instead um, of academic language, we should focus on what are the supports that students need. So I gave you supports. I said, do you notice how in this way, the verb is acting as a noun, right? That was uh, an example of uh, language architecture. I'm scaffolding and supporting your understanding. I also talked about how the Volstead Act uh, was, was a form of law, right? Um, so we might not understand Volstead Act because it's named after a person, but if we can see that the act is equal to the law, then we can make some sense of this passage. So all of the things that I was doing to teach this passage to you, when I finally gave you the, the, the summary, right, this passage is about two things. First, it's about the passage that Americans don't want to follow the law. And the second thing is just because you pass a law doesn't mean that they follow it. All of those are examples of ways that I supported your understanding of this text using additional supports. So for our students, what are the supports they need to make sense of some of these complex language demands or complex language uh, features, right? So Nelson uh, says two common answers that I have heard from educators are that academic language includes content-specific vocabulary and complex sentence structures. They contrast this with non-academic language that they describe as less specialized and less complex. But if we think about language, all language is complex and all language is designed for specific features to help us achieve specific tasks. So in the context of schooling, how do we help students understand these ideas? What can we make explicit? How can we build in supports to get them to understand these concepts and these ideas? All right. So he says, one metaphor that might allow us a point of entry into challenging this dichotomous framing or these two views is language architecture. Like a building architect, language architects are not free to simply do whatever they want. If this were the case, buildings would be unsafe and communicative efforts would fail. Yet beyond some general parameters, both must adhere to an order to successfully complete their tasks. There is a great deal of decision making that both make that reflect their own unique vision and voice. So how do we build and design instruction that supports students and sees them as resourceful rather than sees them as lacking, right? This is about assets-based orientations. Okay, the final uh, 
maybe topic that we need to consider with regard to TESOL is this notion of language and neoliberalism. So neoliberalism is an ideology, it's a belief system, and it's the idea that markets can decide what is best, right? So if we put things in competition, then we can make them better. So I saw this often in China, right? Uh, there were all kinds of English training centers, right? And they all marketed themselves, uh, come to our center and you get one-on-one -on -one tutoring or come to our center and you get one-on-one -on -one tutoring plus a mobile application that can help you learn the language better. And then they're all trying to do different things to get people to attract to their language center so that they can give them English so that then they can go out and be competitive in the job force, right? So this idea of neoliberalism is like, if we can get these people to compete, we'll drive up the quality of education. And then when they get better educated, they'll have more languages that they know that will then help them in the global marketplace. But as a result, it has made language teaching and learning in large part into a commodity, right? And we saw from the example, uh, from the racial-linguistic ideologies, that just because you can speak all of these different languages does not necessarily mean that you can get a hold ahead in the global marketplace, because sometimes you encounter racism in the marketplace or the type of English that you speak. Let's say there's two speakers, one from Indonesia and one from India. Who might get the job? Well, maybe it depends on who they think has the stronger accent. And if they think the Indian person has the stronger accent than the Indonesian person, then maybe the Indonesian person gets the job. Maybe it's based on who has the lighter skin. If the Indian man has a lighter skin versus the Indonesian person gets the lighter skin, then maybe they get the job, right? So all of these things, just because we have the knowledge or just because we have the expertise, doesn't mean that there's these other factors at play that often, often delimit us, right? So my daughters were born in China and my daughters grew up uh, speaking English, but also knowing Chinese. And all of our friends said to us, oh, this is so good. We love that your daughters are speaking Chinese because then when they grow up, they'll have an easy time getting a job. Many people said that to us. We had neighbors next door to, they lived next door to us and they were refugees from Turkey. And so when their kids went to school, they didn't say, oh, it's so great that you know Turkish and you know English, right? They totally disavowed because they were refugees and because their skin was darker than ours, their two languages were not seen as, as great as my daughter's two languages, in large part because they, they were thinking, you're from Turkey and you were in Russia and you need to know English. This is America, right? Even though in the US, we don't have a national language, right? So there's no national language in the US. We have multiple variations of language. Um, and yet, we still have this idea of a monolingual mindset, right? Mono one and lingual is one language. Um, so we see this all the time in the US context and we must fight against the monolingual mindset which suggests that English is the best language or that if you speak English, it's the only language that you need to know. So the point here being that if we're preparing students to work in a global market uh, place, it, it could be one goal but it shouldn't be the only goal because it reduces language users' goals for learning a language, right? People want to learn a language more than just for a good job. Maybe they want to learn a language to communicate with a family member, or they want to learn a language to engage in culture, or they want to learn a language to understand uh, history, or they want to learn a language because they just in general like learning languages. So in TESOL, we often have confrontations with global markets and global commodities as a means of learning a language. So when we think about the premier journal in the field, it's TESOL Quarterly. And what I would suggest that you could do is kind of, if you do a Google Scholar search, whether you have access to this journal or not, you can definitely read the abstracts and kind of see in the last three years, in the last five years, where is the field shifting? Where is the field headed? What are people saying about uh, 
the, the things that we need to be talking about, right? So just a few years ago, there was a special edition um, of, of TSO quarterly, and uh, it was looking at multimodality, which is something that I talk about, right? Um, not in this presentation, but in other, uh, in other uh, presentations. And so if we want to focus on a multilingual environment, then we must concern, uh, make, be more concerned with uh, multimodality, right? So there was an article saying, we need more TESOL research that looks at multimodality, right? And so then the field is answering that call, right? Right now they're saying, hey, all these old theories are, are kind of falling out of favor. We need to address this multilingual turn in TESOL, right? Um, so if you go into uh, the journal archives, you can see where they're doing. At the same time, we need to be aware and recognize that um, there's a lot of gatekeeping that happens. There's all these shifts that are happening in the field, but some people are not happy with this, right? So if I am Jim Cummins, who has built an entire career on these theories, and now everyone is pushing back against my theories, I'm going to feel sad that my life's work is being pushed to the side. And so people are really grappling with uh, what are these turns? And even though they're needed, what are the consequences or what are, what are the, um, the, the fallout of, of, of these approaches, right, in the shifts in the field? So those are the, the main topic ideas I wanted to talk about tonight, which was about translanguaging, about dynamic bilingualism about raciolinguistic ideologies, about academic language, and about what the major publication in our field is saying. So what you should do is take some time to yourself to reflect, uh, how did what I shared tonight build on what you already know? Um, are there any ideas or approaches that you want to try in your future teaching? And then, of course, now I will turn it over to thinking about some of the different questions that we might have. We will. Thank you so much, Matthew. Yeah. So first of all, I haven't introduced that today's uh, students are in a third grade. Yeah, in a third semester students, and also they are. Um, so this semester take uh, TESOL's course and I am one of the assigned lectures in TESOL course. Okay, that's, so that's what Matthew uh, delivered to us about current issues in TESOL context. So they are translanguaging. Okay, so we also have phrasal linguistics, had a literacy. So then I invite students to have a questions you can use the chat features to write your questions or just unmute, raise your hand, unmute the, the, this, the audio, then identify yourselves. Anyone? Anyone? Okay, maybe from the lectures probably. Yeah, Bu Dian. Well, okay. I believe this is, while waiting for uh, the student uh, to ask the, some questions. Um, for um, the recent uh, publication or re research publication from TESOL quarterly, actually, this is very good, uh, a very reputable journal uh, for, from America. But uh, in our university, actually, for the accessibility for TESOL quarterly in Universitas Brawijaya, we have uh, no access uh, to that uh, TESOL quarterly. But uh, some of the lectures here, uh, they have the access uh, from Universitas Negeri Mawang. Uh, we have the Cambridge and also TESOL quarterly. I think it is. Uh, good for us as a lecturer uh, to uh, compiling uh, the recent publication to know uh, what are uh, yeah uh, good strategies that use in uh, teaching TESOL, especially for um, 
dynamic bilingualism, uh, Matthew. Actually, uh, now I'm teaching in second language uh, acquisition. And also I teach my students about bilingualism and multilingualism. And I do really uh, want to know about uh, what is the fluidity of uh, dynamic bilingualism that you uh, mentioned before. Can you uh, yes, maybe specify uh, in which area that um, the users of language use a dynamic uh, bilingualism? Thank you. Yes. So I'll be really uh, happy to give some examples. So I uh, spent, and, and I think I, I will say this. So, so thank you, um, Catherine. I think I talked a lot about theory tonight, but I didn't talk a lot about pedagogy. So I will use this time now to talk about some of the pedagogical, some of the, the, the actual classroom practices of, of these beliefs. So I spent four years in a high school in the US context uh, with it was a high school in a city that had many uh, refugees and immigrants from around the world came to live in this community. So this high school was made up of uh, students from over 60 different countries around the world, and they spoke upwards of 72 different languages all in one high school, right? So basically, it's as if the world had come into this high school. So you have all kinds of cultural difference and linguistic difference. You have Muslim students, you have Buddhist students, you have um, you know, atheists. So there's just so much variety in the school. So I was working in a social studies classroom and in the United States, one of the goals of schooling, which is true in many countries, is to teach citizenship, right? So what does it mean to be an American or what does it mean to be Chinese or what does it mean to be Indonesian? So in the, in the social studies classes, they were studying US government, right? And so one of the units there, America is a democracy and we have three branches of government. We have the executive, like the president that uh, is in charge of, you know, kind of oversight. We have the judicial branch, which is the, the legal system. Uh, and we have the legislation system, which is responsible for passing the laws. So students were engaged in a unit where they were studying the judicial branch. And because the judicial branch is concerned with passing laws, students were talking about litigation. So if we think about litigation, it's, it's a specific term about like engaging in legal challenges to the law. So if you sue someone, you're involved in litigation. And in the, in the US context, often for the Supreme Court, our cases go up the different court system until they reach the top court. So students that day were talking about the Supreme Court and I watched two Spanish speaking girls who were trying to see what, what does this word mean litigation? And what they did was they went to the Spanish cognate. And so the Spanish cognate is, uh, is uh, litigara, right? So if we think about the word litigate, and litigara, they're very similar. So they were negotiating for meaning. And she was saying, I think this word litigation is the same word that we have in Spanish called litigara. So this is an example of two students who are communicating for meaning using their first language to understand an academic contest in their second language. So this was an example of them translanguaging, but they were translanguaging uh, around uh, the cognates, right? Now, as I said earlier on the call, sometimes we don't have cognates, like Indonesian and English maybe don't have the cognates. So it works in some cases, but not in all cases. So now I will give a second example. So the students were talking about uh, kind of the notion of interpreting the law. And there was an uh, Arabic speaking student and um, she, she knew that the student was Muslim and had a background. And so she was talking to him about his own cultural practices. And she was saying, you know, I know that many of you follow different religious traditions in this class. Um, for many of you, your holy text is an authority, right? So if we're gonna think about the Quran, 
we understand that the Quran cannot necessarily be translated, right? The Quran should stay in Arabic, but we can interpret the meaning of the law. So then she said, it's very similar in the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court is not trying to translate these laws. The Supreme Court is trying to interpret whether or not these laws are uh, constitutional or whether they should be enforced. So in this instance, the teacher was drawing on the student's lived experience, his use of the Quran as an authority text in his life, and the notion that the, the, the idea that the Quran cannot be translated, it must be interpreted to make a connection to the Supreme Court. So when we think about translanguaging, we know that it's this fluidity of the linguistic and the cultural practices, right? I'll give a third example. So they were talking about a veto. And a veto is something that the president uh, can do to override a law, right? Um, and so if the, if the legislative branch in the US passes a law and the president doesn't like it, then he can veto the law, right? And then if Congress wants to override the president, then two thirds must vote to override the veto, right? So in this instance, uh, there were some students in the class who came from a Central Asian country that was, uh, um, it was a matriarchy, right? So she was talking to students and she says, let's say you wanna go out on Friday night with your friends and your, your dad says yes and your mom says no. Who has the veto power? If your mom says yes and your dad says no, do you get to go or not? And some students were like, oh yeah, because my dad can override my mom. But then she said, okay, but some of you come from a, a place where your mother decides. So if the mother says no and the father says yes, you can't go, right? So in this instance, she was drawing a cultural connection about permissions and who has more power to talk about who can veto. Can your mom override your dad's decision? Can your dad override your mom's decision? So collectively, her awareness of students' languages and their cultures and their practices allowed her and her students to make meaning across these different ideas. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Matthew. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Ibudian. Yes, thank you. So that's a good, uh, nice discussions here, getting about the uh, bilinguals. Okay, students. Okay, Taufik Munajat. Yes. So from topics from in the cultural language learning, okay. Many of students sometimes, even the teacher also, are having process to always translating L1 to L2, and the vice versa. Do you have some tips, okay, or perhaps method or techniques that can be used to reduce this uh, process, okay, switching <laughs> in mm -hmm. the classroom? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your great question. So I think I would suggest that all of these things are part of a broader negotiation for meaning, right? We're trying to make understanding. And so translation is a thing, right? Like if I was going to speak and I don't know your language, someone is going to have to translate, right? Um, so I'm, I'm not saying per perhaps that, that, that translanguaging gets rid of uh, translation. But when we think about the trans, we should focus on the fluidity, right? So maybe you're thinking about, and I did this a lot in Chinese, right? So in Chinese, grammatically speaking, the time word and the place word must always go in the front of the sentence, right? So if you wanna say something grammatically correct in Chinese, you must say, last week on Thursday afternoon, we went to the store. But in the English, we can say, oh, we went to the store last week on Thursday in the afternoon, right? It doesn't matter, right? We can place time words and place words anywhere, right? So in my head, I had to reconsider how do I rethink about this, right? And so my teacher would be like, ah, 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 you know, and she would say, move the time word and the place word to the front. So, you know, 
昨天晚上我们去买东西, right? So I would remember, okay, last week uh, or yesterday, we went and bought some things, right? So I, in my mind, had to like do that. Now, was I translating? Not necessarily, but I was trying to think about my grammar pattern and this grammar pattern are different. So as I think about my repertoire for using language, I need to remember to move the time word in the place where it's the beginning of the sentence, always and ever, right? So this is an example where I was, I was making sense across two sentences, but I had to draw on all that I knew, all of the features of the language, realizing that in Chinese, to be grammatically correct, the time word in the place where it had to go to the beginning of the sentence, right? So translation is natural, it will happen, but as we internalize these things, it's less of a switching from one to the other. It's an understanding of in this language, what features do I need to follow? In Chinese, you must follow the feature that the time word and the place word go at the beginning, right? Now, some things don't get translated. So in, in English, we have you know past tense, future tense, past perfect, you know, uh, past progressive. In Chinese, if you want to make something past tense, you just add la. It's a particle, right? So, um, 我忘了。今天我们吃好了。昨天我们去买东西,当时他们都不聊了, uh, 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 right? So, when I say each of these, these sentences in these expressions, I'm making it past tense by adding la, but the context of what I'm saying could have been I read the book yesterday. I had been reading the book. I finished reading the book, right? They're making sense out of the la. So I know the grammatical feature of Chinese is that the context of the sentence tells me, is it past perfect? Is it present progressive, right? So they're able to determine that. So the linguistic features of languages differ but if you're aware of how all of these features are working together, then the context and the meaning is a part of that speech act, right? So I'm not necessarily translating, I'm just being aware that in Chinese, past tense will always use lo. I hope that helps. Okay, so Taufik, I hope that you get, uh, you are satisfied with the answer, with the response. Okay, yes, thank you. Another, please. Okay, Fatasha, Fatasha. Oh, okay, so we have. Okay, now let's stop to uh, invite the students. Unmute Teresia. Okay, please, I welcome you to tell for the questions, Teresia. Hello, uh, good morning for all of my good morning. Doctors, and good night from. Matthew. Good evening. Oh, yes. Good evening. Oh, it's okay. Yes. Good morning. Good evening. It's fine. <laughs> My name is Teresia. You can call me Tara. And I'm from TESOL Class B. And so from uh, this topic today, uh, I, I have an... I get... Uh, wait, I'm sorry for... Second. It's okay. okay. There's, I get uh, an understanding. The delay that, is okay. It's fine. I get an understanding that TESOL is recognized reckoning with race and colonization, and I believe uh, they will not give an advantageous situation for people like Abu Bakar. And as a student, what can we do to make a difference in this situation? How about like we do some campaign? And also for Sir Matthew, what do you think? Uh, do you think it will make a difference? Because uh, when I become a teacher, I also don't want my students to become blame themselves because of the situation like Abu Bakar. I want my students to be aware that this is a real situation and, and it's not your fault if you can, uh, you didn't get choose because of you then have an accent or something like that. Even so, you have so many uh, knowledge about different languages. That's all. Thank you. 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 Thank you
Thank you. Yes. So thank, thank you. you so much. So I think my answer to that is it's very important to have raised awareness, right? So one thing we can do, just do is not ignore it, right? For too long, the field does not want to talk about race, does not want to talk about colonial histories, right? It's inconvenient or there's violence in the past or bad things happened, right? So in my country, you know, we're a nation that was founded on many immigrants. But even today, there are people from Haiti who their president was killed and there was a terrible earthquake. And they're trying to come to the United States to seek asylum. And at our borders, we're meeting them and pushing them back out, right? So we should talk about this, right? Um, I, I had noted before that anti-Blackness uh, is, is, a, is a global phenomenon, right? So around the world, there is a dislike for Black people. Uh, we, we frame Black people, not we, but people historically have framed Black people as being intellectually inferior or saying that Black people are savages, like very awful and horrific things. Like humanity, humans are humans, right? We all have strengths and weaknesses. We, you know, not one of us is better or different than another one of us as a human, right? Um, we might be more educated or we might have more opportunity, but generally speaking, all humans are, are equal under, under, the, under the God, right? So I think um, we, should, we should be explicit, right? Even for me tonight, right? It's, it's not easy to talk about race. It's not comfortable to talk about race. But if we don't address these things, then we cannot find a solution. So I think one of the best ways to, 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 uh, to, to work towards ratiolinguistics is to understand sometimes the problem is not the speaker, right? It's the listener. The listener is the one who needs to change. When we go back to that slide, the person who should change is not the person applying for the job, but rather it's the interviewer he needs to realize he is not listening well to a man that speaks four languages. He is not positioning well a man that has all of the appearance of a businessman. Instead, he is rejecting this man based on the color of his skin and not the quality of his skills and what he can do for the position. So if we want to uh, make progress, we should not avoid talking about this we should raise our students' awareness to how it happens, and we should give real examples of this in the society, right? So we can talk about, like me, today in the US, we're driving out the Haitians. Why? In large part because Haitians are Black, right? And there's anti-Blackness in the US. There has been historically. And so these are important conversations to have uh, so that we can confront these uh, very dark and very evil ways of thinking about other people. Well, so that's a great uh, questions and also great uh, answers. Is it Tere? Are you satisfied? Yes, or do you I am. <laughs> okay. Yes. Uh, before we have uh, uh, dark questions from Ascadia, I uh, let me give the chance for Fatash, Fatsha. Sorry. So, what is the solutions of the race? Yeah, racial linguistics or race concepts. Yeah, so from the text, I think really that we all have this work to do. We should all be a part of having these conversations um, and we should not avoid these topics, right? They are uncomfortable. They are not easy to talk about, uh, but if we, if we ignore it, it will not make the, the problem go away. So um, I think racism is a big part of our, um, our global society. And until we change our racist thinking, uh, we will continue to have these problems. So if I can change my thinking and I can challenge my students to change their thinking and people's thoughts about race change, then hopefully, like, let's say one of our students grows up, then they're interviewing someone. They're like, oh, you speak four languages. You're way more qualified than this white person who only speaks one. Okay, yes, thank you. And then I welcome Ascadia to have the questions. Um, hello, Mr. Matthew. Um, hello. My name is Cardia, and, and I think my question is out of the topic. And 
my question is, I'm really interested with uh, media, so media that can uh, that can increase our students' motivation to learn English. And you said that uh, you really like to uh, tutoring. Is it right? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And you know about do you know about Twitter space? Yeah. Yes. And, uh, my question is, uh, maybe you have some recommendation for me or uh, that uh, that some account, some account that that uh, maybe uh, what is it like? Uh, show us about the Twitter Spaces, something like that. Mm -hmm. Do you get what I mean? Yes. So <laughs> I think. Um, thank you. I you know. Uh, my my job is digital literacies and multilingual students. So uh, tonight's topic is around multilingualism, translanguaging. Uh, but my other uh, speeches have been about you know digital literacies. So I think one of the best ways is to start to follow scholars who do this work. So if you wanted to follow on Twitter Nelson Flores, or if you wanted to follow uh, Jonathan Rosa. Um, if you wanted to follow uh, Ophia Garcia, right? Um, so you can also, uh, you can look out for uh, different uh, academics um, and, and try to follow them. You can also follow some of these journals. Um, but I think if you're thinking about using Twitter with your students, uh, you know, Twitter has only 280 characters as we know, right? But you can also have pictures. Uh, so you have images. Uh, you can have hyperlinks. Uh, you can uh, post news articles. So I think Twitter is a really good way. And then you can see, like, if something is being retweeted a lot, um, maybe you should check it out, right? Um, but I think all of these are, are approaches that you can follow. And then as well um, is the notion of, like, on Twitter, you can do many of the language tasks that you would do in informal writing, right? Um, so I'll give you an example. Oops, sorry, I'm typing in the chat, right? So often we're concerned about persuasion, right? Uh, how can we persuade someone? So if you think about Twitter, acts of per persuasion uh, have claims and there's evidence and there's reason, right? There's theory. So in 280 characters, I can compose a tweet that does the same things as academic writing for persuasion, right? I think all people should wear masks because COVID-19 is still uh, hurting our society. Yesterday, 3,000 Americans died from COVID, right? So I have my claim. I think that, uh, that people should wear masks. I have my evidence. The global pandemic is still going on and 3,000 people have died yesterday. And behind that is my reason. I think we should care for our society. I think we should care for our public health. If we care for public health, we will wear the mask because we do not wear the mask for ourselves. We might wear the mask for the other person, right? So even this small tweet that's less than 280 characters, I have persuaded people a claim and evidence and a reason. So you could engage in an activity with your students where you have them tweet something to an express an idea or to speak back to an idea, right? So this would be a helpful way to bring in uh, digital literacies in support of students' uh, language learning. Okay, Skadias, I think that you get the point that uh, from the Matthew regarding the tweet, yeah? or retweet. Okay, so we come to another question from Maria. Okay, Maria, you can unmute to start your questions. Okay, thank you, Ma'am Dian. Hello and good day, everyone. Okay, Hi. so also good evening for Mr. Matthew. <laughs> thank you, good morning to you. <laughs> okay, thank you. So uh, I have a question here, Mr. Matthew. So uh, actually during my second language acquisition and teaching class, uh, I should I studied code switching and now I'm learning translanguaging from your materials as well sir uh, I'm wondering about two things could you please explain the difference between code switching and 
translanguaging in a nutshell, sir. Thank you, Kenley. Oh, I wish I could do this well for you, but the field is still grappling with this. And so um, I don't know that I can succinctly get, I can give you my thoughts, but please know that people are writing whole academic articles on this whole idea, right? How is code switching different? In fact, there's a really good piece uh, in TESOL quarterly that I could pass on uh, around this topic uh, that your your I could email it to the team and then the three in one program can can share that article with everyone. I think this article gives a better example than me, but I think code switching is a part of translanguaging, but it is not all encompassing, right? So translanguaging considers culture and language and gesture and all of these resources together, whereas code switching is often concerned only with one named language to another named language, right? So translanguaging is less about going between two languages and the flows among them. Now, this is still contested. Some people would say code switching is translanguaging. And some people would say code switching is a part of translanguaging. And some people would say code switching reflects the two solitudes. We shouldn't talk about code switching, right? And then in another context, in the US context, for Black people, Code switching means shifting the register, right? So the dialect and the variation that they use speaking to other Black people is different than in a school setting or different than in a business setting. So code switching there is connected between language and cultural practices, right? So it depends on when we're thinking about code switching, is it language? Is it language and culture? Is it a mix of the two? Um, so I don't have a good answer for you other than to say, Everyone is, what's the difference? Like, I don't know. So it's very contested. Okay, so that's a good question, uh, Maria. Maybe lectures and students, we can raise this topic into our topic class. Yeah, class topics to be discussed or to be explored more in the class, yeah? Maybe find out uh, the examples or how to deal with the switching coach and trans translanguaging based on Indonesian's context. Okay, yeah. thank you, Matthew, and also Maria. Uh, Safrina? Safrina? Yes, okay. ma'am. So thank many you, good Mathia. questions. Thank you, everyone. These are great questions. Okay. Yeah, Please. Safrina, this could good be evening. yours. Good evening, Mr. Matthew, and good morning, everyone. My name is Safrina, and I'm from TESOL B class. It's great to having you here, Mr. Matthew. Excuse me, in the previous, you mentioned about white English. Uh, could you give more explanation about it? Or maybe you have recommendations about books or maybe journals that related to that topic. So I can learn more about it. Thank you in advance. Yes, so I think if I understand correctly around the white English practices, Is that correct? Safrina, is that what yes, you mean? Sir. Yes. Um, yes, sir. So I think, you know, um, I think the best way to, to, to understand this better is to consider uh, variations from this. So one of the best ways to do this, uh, there's a professor, her name is April Baker Bell. And uh, she has a, a book that is published by NCTE, which is the National Council for the teachers of English. Um, and uh, it is called Linguistic Justice. And uh, it is, so in this book, she compares the African American vernacular English uh, to, to white standard English. And so I think if you want to well understand white English, you should understand what it's been compared to, right? So I think this book uh, is a really good way to understand how linguistic variation in the US context is compared between white English and uh, different Creoles or different versions, uh, dialects uh, or vernaculars of English. Um, and I think I, I will just, I, I will admit, you know, 
between global north and global south, like there is a lot of difference in access, right? So I'm in the US, I can order books, my library can get me many resources. Um, and I think someone had a question about neoliberalism, right? I think one of the hardest things about neoliberalism is that it takes away resource to different people. So more people get more resource and less people, like more people get less resource. And so I understand in coming here to share with you, I'm bringing some resources with me, uh, but that you might not have access to the same resource. And I think that's a problem, right? Um, because a lot of these journals, it's expensive to get the subscription, right? If I was not affiliated with my institution, I could not afford to get access to these things, right? But because my job is a researcher, then I get that access. So it's a real trade-off because let's say I wanted to go, go do good work, but not work. For, let's say I want to teach high school again. I want to take all my ideas and expertise to high school. Then suddenly I can't access these articles anymore. So then I'm cut off from the knowledge base. So it is a, it is a problem. And I want to acknowledge that sometimes it's hard to get these resources. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Matthew. Okay, thank you. So I think for several questions uh, attached in the, in the chat, chat features already answered, yes. Matthew. Okay, yes. yes. Yes, so, so I think that, yes, Matthew. Oh, sorry, I, I didn't mean to cut you off. Um, I see the, the student, uh, Ukab Stanley, has asked about power, right? Um, oh, the question I see. is, from your presentation, it seems that language have a lot to do with power or people in power. How does this impact our language learning and what negative sides that we need to be aware of? So I would want to argue that knowing multiple languages unlocks more power for you, right? Because if I speak two or three languages, I can look at media from two or three different countries and from two or three different perspectives, right? So I think we all know that education and that knowledge is a form of power. So the more that we can access education, we can empower ourselves, right? Even tonight, right? My presentation gives you some knowledge and I'm learning from you. And so collectively we're having these conversations that might shape and shift our field because ultimately we want our students to feel like they are accepted, like they belong, like they have a uh, capacity to be doing great work in the world, right? And so if we can empower our students to see their languages and to see their cultures as valuable, then they can have confidence and speak back to people that would say, oh, you don't speak English well, or you, know, you could say to them, you only know English. Like I know three languages, in fact, this is a great thing, like learning one language that even though English is a world language, like I have all this other understanding. So we can kind of speak back and encounter story some of these, these ideas and arguments. Um, but I do think, right, um, we can gain power. So like I have a lot of power because I have a PhD. I'm employed by a American institution. I have an American passport. And so for me, as a white man with all of these powers, I want to use that power to good. I want other people to benefit from my teaching and my research and my scholarship. So whatever way you can have to make change in the world or make change in your school or your community or your class, that's a way that we can empower others, right? To use our abilities to help others grow and get them more ability. The negative side, once you have power, is not to abuse that power to others <laughs> because then you have control. Like I have four doctoral students. My job is to help them become professors. I could write on their paper, I disagree. I don't like your idea, change your thinking. But if I do that and it goes against who they are, then, then, then I'm blocking them, right? So rather than giving them barriers and giving them roadblocks, I want to open the doors for them, right? So I want to use my power not against them, but use my power for them. Okay. The point. Assist them. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. And I'm sorry for Najwa. 
Najwa. Yes. Okay, to miss your questions. <laughs> okay. Then, uh, yeah, Najwa's questions regarding about the racism. So I think we, we you have already explained just like mm -hmm. uh, Fatsa's questions. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So that's all for the questions. <laughs> Discuss. Oh, I saw one more. Can I answer the one question? Uh, okay. Around neoliberalism, right? So I think the thing, right, the thing that you should know is that this is a global system and it's probably not going to change, but you should be aware, like, what are the messages that you're hearing about, oh, if you know more languages, you'll have more success, right? That's not always true. So just be aware of like, this idea is very neoliberal and then you can reject that idea if you want. Okay, yes. So that's Bima Eza. So yeah, I hope that you get the points of your questions and the responses. We have Ethan for the last. Ethan, the okay, screen is thank yours. You. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. So uh, good evening, Mr. Deru. Uh, Hello, like good morning, Ethan. So uh, as an Indonesian, it's kind of obvious that English is our second language. And I really love speaking in English, but I've been facing problems like when, uh, in my daily speaking in Bahasa, sometimes I lost some uh, vocabularies and the, the vocabularies that, that came up in my head is like in English and vice versa. When I'm trying to speak in English, sometimes, sometimes I just like, uh, I lost it. Then the word that came up is in Indonesia. I mean, mm -hmm. so how do I overcome it? Uh, and have you ever, face the same problem when you're trying to speak in Chinese, maybe? Yes, or... yes, very, yes, yes, totally, totally. Um, I think this is just the nature of language. Unfortunately, I think, you know, we, we lose language or we have to revitalize language or we have to like sometimes rememorize the word or the expression, um, you know, and sometimes there are words that are better in one language than in another. Like, in Chinese, there's this word no, which is like the, the deep, rich essence of something. We don't have the same word in Chinese. So sometimes when I talk with my friends, even in America, I'm like, we don't have the word for this, but Chinese does, and it's this, right? So I think realize language loss is normal. Getting forgotten is normal. Um, and just sometimes, you know, like being multilingual, uh, there's so many good things that happen, but then sometimes like Zemashwa, like Wawangla, Zemashwa, Jama, Shama Isa, Shama, you know, like that's me in Chinese, like what's the meaning? And like, oh, I forgot it, or how do I say it? Like, that's just part of language. So it's it's normal. I'm sorry, I don't have an answer other than we we often all feel this way. So it is natural. Yeah. So then you can give more exposure by listening to the language, or by listening to the English more just to help you find out or enrich your vocabularies. I say. <laughs> yes, yeah, I thank yeah, you. It's, it's quite encouraging. So yeah, thank you so much, Mr. Duru. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Matthew. So I think Evan's questions that we that close our discussions from today. Thank you so much for the in, uh, interesting and very great questions from all of you students means that you do enthusiasts for having this discussions under uh, current issues uh, in TESOL's context, yeah. And also I do, thanks to Matthew, I do appreciate for sharing knowledge, sharing experience regarding our topic today. And yeah, we hope that we can explore more, yeah? <laughs> yes. Explore more. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for listening and for your questions and your engagement. Uh, it is my honor to learn with you tonight. Thank you so much.